foreign collaborations, investments that we are doing, is it enough to nurture the next generation of food entrepreneurs and companies? Thank you, Manisha. Thank you, Manisha, because uh, I think it's an extremely important question. You know, if India really has to fulfill its potential, if India really has to deliver on the promise of uh, not just uh, being a self-sufficient country in terms of food security, but also catering to the needs of the world, I think we have to really augment our capacities. We have to do a lot more than what we are currently engaged in. The first thing I would, uh, you know, strongly say, while we are doing some things right, I think there are certain things which we can get right. Just to give you a macro picture of what the current situation in the country is. India has about 41 crore acres of land, which is arable, which is, which is uh, uh, suitable for cultivation, which is suitable for agriculture and allied activities. We have more than 1,40,000 TMCs of water. 1,40,000 TMCs of water. A broad approximate number is one TMC can irrigate nearly 10,000 acres of land. A very approximate number. Even if you assume for a minute that out of the 140,000 TMCs of water, 70,000 gets evaporated, dried, etc., etc., we still are left with 70,000 TMCs of water. Out of which, unfortunately, only 20,000 has been tapped. 50,000 TMCs of water every single year, unfortunately, goes into the oceans, wasted. Now, what needs to happen in India is while we see the extremes of weather, you know, we people talk about climate change all the time. We, see, we are seeing extremes of weather. There are areas in India where we are completely dependent on rain, you know, rain-fed crops and rain-fed agriculture. And then there are other areas which are perennially hit by floods and, uh, you know, the deltas, etc., which are perennially struck by abundance of water and abundance of, uh, uh, you know, nature. What we ought to do, in, like in the case of Telangana, what we have done, we have completed and we have delivered the world's largest lift irrigation project, where we lift water from 82 meters above sea level and lift it all the way to 618 meters above sea level. We have completed this project with an investment of more than 1 lakh crore in a matter of three and a half, four years. Now, if Telangana, the newest state of India, can do this, why can't the rest of India do it as well? We have irrigated by this project 45 lakh acres of water, uh, 45 lakh acres of land, and all the numbers that you just heard from our ministers in terms of agri expansion, in terms of dairy expansion, in terms of fisheries, in terms of storage capacities. All of this is a result of unwavering support, unflinching commitment to create more and more of these irrigation potential. Now that is something that the rest of India needs to do. The second thing I'll also mention quickly, if India really has to ensure that we find that rightful spot, we have to focus on post-harvesting and what needs to be done to add value. Because the farmers are extremely hardworking, they are doing their best. With all of our support, you know, in Telangana, we, we provide 24 hours of free power. We also provide them with quality seeds. We provide them with quality fertilizers. More importantly, we provide them with farm input assistance. We have already provided 65 lakh, 65,000 crores of investment, farm input, through a program called as Raitu Bandhu. We are the first in India, in independent India, to have started this program. We have supported 65 lakh farmers over the last six years, provided 65,000 crores of farm input, and we also provide a farmer life insurance. We insure all the farmers in our state, 40 lakh plus farmers below the age of 60 to the tune of 5 lakh rupees. What this has done has created confidence in the farming sector among the distressed section that this also can be lucrative, this also can be remunerative. We also purchase all the farm produce directly at their doorstep. Now, what this has literally done is allowed us, allowed our farmers to work freely of, without any concerns. And as a result, today Telangana has become the leading paddy producer with the leading fisheries, uh, uh, you know, producing uh, state in the country, etc., etc. The last thing I'll tell you, in 2020, to add value to what our farmers do, we launched a program called as AI for AI, Artificial Intelligence for Agriculture Innovation. How does that help? How does technology which today literally permeates into every sphere of life. How does it help the farmer? How can it help the farmer? Because our chief minister keeps reiterating every single day when we meet him. He says, any technology that does not have a positive societal impact on the common man especially is futile. No matter how fancy it is, no matter how cool it is to talk about a technology, if it does not really have a societal impact in a third world country like India, it's futile. We have used artificial intelligence to detect rainfall patterns, 
we use artificial intelligence today to identify the possible pests that can come up in an area. We use AI to also gauge soil health. Now, these are the kind of things. Innovation through technology, support systems, focus on irrigation. I think these are the things that are going to help India achieve its rightful place. I heard Dr. Ramesh Chand very clearly when he said 20% uh, of world's dairy needs are being, 24% uh, is coming from India. A small country like New Zealand, you know, they have a company called Fonterra. Fonterra alone as a company, it was earlier called New Zealand Dairy Board, that one single company contributes to 8% of New Zealand as a country's GDP. Now imagine what the agri and allied sectors in India can do if we give them that much needed support because we have 60% of India still engaged in this activity. If only they can be given the support because it's not fancy, it's not cool, I agree. You know, it's not glamorous, it's not space tech, it's not IT, but we need to support them so that they can actually be a game changer for our country, create employment avenues, create revenue, create wealth. Thank you. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, there's so much being done. And Dr. Jan, this question is to you. And as we look forward, I mean, I want to start from what we are doing right now in sense of policy measures also. There is this, as the conversation has been about uh, doubling farmers' income. And then we have uh, poverty and hunger uh, erosion uh, to be rated as well. There is a target for that too. There is a Garib Kalyan Yojana also happening. There is an ethanol target also there in the market. So there is just so much happening right now. And this is happening because we have seen these problems, these concerns a decade or two decade back. But when we talk about the decade forthcoming, how are these policies going to work and what new policies are needed? Uh, thank you, Manisha. In fact, uh, Agriculture is at a stage where we need to bring profound changes in the sectors. Otherwise, the, the, the potential of the sector will go uh, unharnessed. Let me share with you a few changes which has serious implication for change in policy. Our per capita food production was just 1.2 kg per person per day at the turn of the century. Now we are producing 1.9 kg food per person per day in, in during year 2022, an increase of 50% in 20 years. In the coming years, the growth rate in food production is accelerating, but population growth rate is decelerating. So it implies that one third of the increase in food production in India has to find a market. That market could be overseas market for raw produce. That market could be through food processing. So if we do not pay attention to these things, then I think you will face problem of gloves, pressure on government, give us MSP, cover milk also under MSP, cover mango also under uh, MSP. So therefore, this today's uh, uh, conclave uh, I feel it's very important to, to prepare a roadmap on how we link agriculture with industry, how we link food production with food processing, so that farmers don't look at government for MSP. They find that, uh, that uh, by promotion of food processing industry, they are a partner in this uh, growth uh, process. They get better prices. Let me also share another number with you, which I have produced in the Finance Commission report and in some other document also. If you divide agriculture in the five segments, fishery, livestock, horticulture, and other crop like beet, uh, rice, cotton, sugar cane, you will just find that there is a negative relationship between the support given by government to the segment of agriculture and growth rate of that segment. Fishery hardly receive any support of government, like subsidy on import or MSP. The growth rate is in double digit. Then comes livestock. Yes, little bit support here and there, like Telangana also give four rupees per liter uh, to, to help the farmer. Then you find that that comes second in the growth rate. Rice, wheat, cotton, where there is maximum growth, free power, fertilizer subsidy, MSP, if you calculate the subsidy content, it is very high. The growth rate is not even 1.5%.
So it is the demand which is driving the growth rate in uh, Indian agriculture and power of demand is much stronger than the, the than but farmer get through government support. But we need to create enabling environment for demand side factor to, to promote income of the farmer. And that is possible, I think, if we go for this linkage, uh, value chain development, uh, export uh, uh, promotions. Uh, you also point a little bit toward uh, what is happening to hunger, what is happening to, uh, to uh, poverty. Uh, we do not have a national estimate on these things after 11, 12. Currently, the survey is uh, being uh, conducted. Hopefully, uh, by October, November, we will have the fresh uh, estimates. But if per capita food production in the country is increasing by 2.5% consistently year after year, definitely it will reduce the hunger. So it's not that food is just produced and it is going waste. So when we will have some fine, uh, final national estimate, you will find that there is a big change in the hunger, also big change in the incidence of poverty. So my follow-up question really is about on, uh, so what many of these schemes, would you say five years down the lane, <coughs> pardon me, or 10 years down the lane will get redundant and we need to start looking at newer schemes, newer ways to work from here on? No, it's not that um, um, uh, only old schemes are uh, continuing, depending upon the situation in the country. There are new schemes. Like we all know that nutrition and climate and sustainability are a serious concern. So we have scheme for millet promotion of millets. Similarly, we found that uh, uh, efficiency of irrigation was a serious issue. So then there was a scheme, different scheme for irrigation. Similarly, uh, this Matsya Sampada Yojana and like that. So s new schemes uh, keep on coming. It is not that they are uh, decided uh, once for all. Even if you look at the budget, you will find that there are many new initiatives that uh, we want to move to uh, digital agriculture. Personal extension is proving very, very costly. It is also very, very slow. So we want uh, to encourage uh, 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 use of digital uh, platform by both public and private sector for dissemination of information, dissemination of technology. Then to attract the agri startup, there is a accelerator fund. Uh, then there is uh, that uh, promotion of 10,000 uh, FPO. So uh, uh, you will see that whatever uh, ecosystem or mix of scheme you are seeing for agriculture and food processing sector, it is dynamic. Some of the old scheme like uh, Rashtriya Krishi Unati Yojana, but it, it was flexible and it was preferred by state. It is continuing, but at the same time, as and when the need arise, the new schemes are also coming. I'm sure you will see in future that more emphasis on export-oriented production. So it's a dynamic process, and every time in budget, you will find that uh, new kind of schemes are announced. I, I get that, Dr. Jan, because I remember five years ago we were discussing on how the new uh, generation does not want to come into agriculture. But look at where five years have been. Agri-tech companies, startups, and the way the government also has responded to that has been quite positive. Dr. Gupta, this one is to you. And so much conversation about aquaculture and fisheries, and we've seen Telangana actually uh, showcase a very strong number and a lot of uh, initiatives onto that one as well. How do you look at the sector? And when you look at the next 10 years, what is it that you see uh, happening here? What kind of growth are you looking at? What kind of export numbers are you working with? OK, I see a lot of. Uh contribution from India to the global food supply or fish supply that we can talk about. <clears throat> Recent studies have shown that the fish production has to be increased by double the production by 2050 to meet the increase in population, increasing power, purchasing power, and also the realization that fish is a better animal protein than any other land-based animals. So we have been talking about here, we are producing about 17 million tons of fish now, and the government of India says by 20, 22 million tons, but I think there is a more uh, potential not only achieving 22 million tons, much more than what we have. Because I'm telling this one, because we have lost aquatic resources which have been either unutilized or underutilized. 
and also our per, cap, uh, per hectare productions are low compared to some other country. So there is an excellent manpower that is already available, aquatic resources are there, and we'll be able to increase that fish production. And often we say that uh, Andhra Pradesh is the number one leading country because a landlocked state like Telangana has shown that it is possible to increase the fish production and be not only self-sufficient, can also an export into the future, as KTR has said, starting with aquaponum. Now I'm looking at the future. Now we say China is the leader, okay? Major exporter of fish and also a major importer of fish because of huge domestic consumption. But here in case of India, our consumption is much lower. Statistics, five kilos to nine kilograms, but in a big country like India with a different uh, feeding habits and all that, it's very difficult to put in a national average because in states like Gujarat, it may be two to three kilograms per capita, but in states like Varista and Bengal, it could be 40 or 50 kilos. So here there is an opportunity to increase the domestic market because domestic market is very low now, as of now. So if we are talking of increasing the production, we have to also see that our domestic market has to be improved. So how do we do that? How do we increase the per capita consumption of the fish? Right? Now I take the example of the what the poultry section has done few years back, they bombarded the media. The egg is a very good uh, protein, animal protein, it should be consumed like that. So we need a media bleach to bring awareness among the population that fish is a healthy food and better, I should say that, better than any animal protein. So once that is done, I think the consumption level will increase. So can you and come out with a slogan, sir? You know, they have the catchy slogan, remember, Sunday ho ya Monday, rose khao ande. We should come out with something like that for fish as well. Yes, sir, we then should come yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that is one is increasing the domestic consumption that we have been talking about. And also the way that we have been marketing the fish, again, is not that in a good hy a hygienic condition, whether it is in cities and the rural areas. Again, I go to the poultry, what is that has done? You see, ready to eat, you know, instead of cleaning. So we can develop uh, some outlets, as again, Telangana has begun, showcased that one, you know, opened the motor and fish markets and also kiosks and things like that. So transportation of fish, you know, from the production center to the consumption consumers has to be improved, that one. So these, all these things done, we can increase the local demand and also increase the production and also contribute to the globally. Now when you are looking at the other side of the export, okay, we are exporting about eight billion dollars worth of fish now. A country like, small country like Vietnam is exporting 11 billion dollars of fish. So my question is why we are not able to do that with more aquatic resources? Sir, only I'm asking questions. You only please give answers. <laughs> 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 so now there is a bill, because I tell you that again, going back, you know, the fishery sector has not received the attention in the past, in spite of its contribution to the livelihoods, in, in spite of its contribution to the food security, in spite of its contribution to the uh, protein <coughs> securities. But only in the last eight to ten years, the realization has come, the fish could be a part of uh, the food security debate. Because in the past, any policy debates, fish was not included. Mm -hmm. It's only in the last few years, I think, that we have been taken. I have, I have one quick uh, s uh, point to add to what yeah. Sir said. You know, in, in India, especially in my state, there's this traditional religious belief that at the onset of monsoon, you have to consume fish. It's called Mrigashira. What we are now launching, you know, uh, latching onto that sentiment, is a fish festival for three days in all the districts. We are setting up 30 different fish stalls with variety of preparations so that the consumption increases yeah. because it will help both like the fish farmers and also the people by way of improving their health. So we are launching this, something you can recommend for the rest of the, in rest of the country as well. Yeah, sure. Sir. And sir, in the meantime, you are still waiting for that catchy line to come. Yeah. Uh, we will think about it because we don't want to come back. About that. By the end of this panel, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To the milk and animal husbandry then, and everybody has been applauding on what milk as a cooperative, as a segment has done and how we are on to becoming the milk uh, producer to the world. A lot of numbers that you keep sharing, Mr. Sardi, but uh, what is the next 10 years now looking at the kind of production that we have? The last one year clearly has been high on milk inflation. We've seen weather and unseasonal rains and climate change and various other things as well. But the next 10 years, whether it's about technology, innovation, I know we were discussing a lot of things over the dinner last evening as well. So what is happening and how are we looking at the next 10 years now? Well, uh, first of all, uh, 
because all everybody is here. I'd like to congratulate the Telangana government. Well, I've been attending last my 40 year career many such conclaves, uh, but never seen all stalwarts of Indian food industry at one place. That is good. So, and also to the organizers and uh, talking not only one subject, every subject of uh, food and very, very clear, crispy, visionary at the leadership that I was very impressed. Manisha ji, first let me tell you, we are talking about dairy, which is a part of food. <clears throat> and uh, we are very lucky that we are in a country of 140 crore or 1.4 billion stomachs, and which is growing, which will be 165 crore by 2050. And also, if all over the world, if you see where is the most potential for the food sector or organized food sector, it is India. If I give you some numbers, Indian food industry is around 50 lakh crore. But fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for the sector, unorganized is very small. It is only, I can say about 6 lakh crore. 12%. And half of that is dairy. And remaining all poultry, meat, agriculture, all is little half. But a major change in organized dairy sector, or I can say tipping point has come during COVID. But suddenly, whole world has realized the importance of food, importance of food grower or producer, importance of food companies, the supply chain member, distributor, and retailers. And I'm very happy everybody sitting here, they are a producer, they are industry people, they are retailers in the food are sitting here. In dairy, if you talk out of uh, this tree like road, sir, every 25 years, dairy production multiplies by 3x. Professor Ramesh Chan mentioned 24% to the world dairy production, India is contributing. But if you go back 50 years back, we were contributing only 6% or around 24 million metric ton producing. 25 years back, we were contributing only 14%. And our milk production was around 74. And today, again, 3x multiply and contributing 24. The way we are growing at 5.5 to 6%, even if we take 5.5 or 5.8, another 25 years, we'll be producing around 620 million metric ton. 3x and that will be 45 percent of the world milk production and out of that 50 percent will be organized and coming to your question of dairy in next 10 years today if it is 3 lakh crore organized dairy out of around 10 lakh crore total dairy another 10 years this industry will be minimum organized will be 10 lakh crore and total will be around 20 lakh. You give me an example of the industry which is 10 lakh crore, organized in another 10 years. And all I think is that is applicable not to dairy because all the food industry people are there. If you want to grow Indian food industry, the only mantra is give more to the producer, give more to the consumer. If you provide a very stable and remunerative price to the food producer, be it poultry, dairy, agriculture, fruits, vegetable, and also at a very affordable price, good product, make available to the consumer, both con consumer will consume more, and that is going to happen. The reason is that with the income level increasing, prosperity increasing, average consumer is spending more on food, and in food also, they are upgrading themselves from merely carbohydrate-based diet to more of protein and fat rich. And their animal husbandry producers are coming into dairy, poultry, meat, fisheries, all these are coming into, or the oil thing. So one side is that is growing. So other side, if you consume more because it is available at affordable price, farmer will be encouraged to produce more. Because he is also going to get remunerated price. And this is only possible in India 
which is both side masses involved, but both side lower middle class people, is the biggest challenge to the dairy industry or the food industry, whether in poultry, everything is the supply chain efficiency. You know, Mr. Sodhi, a lot of conversation has gone around on why haven't the other industries or other commodities or other agriculture food products have imbibed in the cooperative culture. We've seen that debate a lot of time, but it hasn't really happened. You see, whether other cooperative structures in like fisheries and other imbibed on, I give you an example of uh, Telangana only, sir. Because last 40 years, I mean, the dairy I joined Amul. When I joined Amul 40 years back, <clears throat> there were two brands at the top competing with each other, Amul and Vijaya. And you know history. I mean, where it is basically depend upon the leadership, both political leadership as well as the professional leadership. So any industry, any cooperative, whether any, this, because of masses involved both the side, you can't say only the professional, because when cooperatives are there, it's a democratic setup you need very selfless, dedicated political leadership to take, to, to aggregate the producer or the farmers and also need political leadership to attract, retain, protect best of the professional leadership. So whether any cooperative which has been successful in India, there are examples, and same is the reason for the decline of any cooperative also. All right. So we know where to applaud or point fingers at then. <laughs> this one is to you then. And we look at ITC for various things. But tell us, uh, you know, there has been conversation about various food products. I want to talk to you about, uh, on one side, there are various FTAs happening. We've already talked about on how important the political will into this is. On the other side, there is about changing lifestyle preferences. Millets was a national uh, uh, thing on 2018. Now it's an international millet of years in 2023. So there's lots changing and then technology is coming into it. A lot of apps is uh, something that we can up applaud you for. So how have the last 10 years been? If you can quickly summarize that for us. And what are you now envisioning for the next 10 years? Thanks, Manisha. Uh, before we look at uh, operationally what might happen, uh, let me do a preamble in terms of uh, what is the difference between last 10 years and next 10 years on two aspects that have been talked about just now. One is a very conducive policy that will catalyze and second is an enabling ecosystem that will catalyze. Now the difference between the last 10 years and next 10 years on the same two elements is very fundamental. Two aspects. One is that from the times when we were 1.2 kilos per capita to already at 1.9 and moving forward. In that era, all policy was production driven. Now, as we move forward, it needs to be far more demand responsive. So how do you create that? From a supply chain mindset, we move to a value chain uh, mindset. And that shift is a lot more fundamental than what typically people would uh, imagine. So it's not enough to create productivity, production, processing, but how do you uh, make it demand responsive? Uh, everybody has already pointed out there is plenty of demand which is possible, but how do you channelize in a manner that it becomes more value enhancing is one shift. The second shift is that in the past, we have largely looked at multiple elements of policy as independent policy initiatives, which were all required and made sense in a production-driven system. But they led to a lot of unintended negative consequences. And therefore, in the next 10 years, we need a lot more systems thinking approach water is required free, power is required free, uh, fertilizer is required at a lower cost because farmer is fighting uh, a global war with all her hands tied. So you need all this. But when it is just looked in that spirit, that's what has led to 
water tables going down, natural resources, soil getting completely damaged, and GHG emissions not bothered about, and suddenly now we are seeing climate change, and obviously agriculture, if it rains too little, there's a problem, too much there's a problem, wrong time there's a problem, and therefore how do you mitigate all this? So therefore how do you really create, I'm just drawing one in the interest of time, a similar kind of policies which are just designed for one objective at a time have led to unintended consequences. And therefore, how do you look at an entire systems approach to make that? And therefore, the enabling environment that goes with it is taking care of both these uh, aspects. I think that is the fundamental shift that one needs to look at what do you envision on these two fronts uh, going forward. And obviously, the operational elements will all be related to these shifts. And how do you get the demand signals transmitted back to the production system then becomes a very important element in whether you talked about the tech-based apps that one is building and doing it, or how do you get the collaboration occur between multiple agri-tech players so that farmer gets a, a complete and personalized solution. Uh, those are the kind of things which will shift now, uh, even on the operational front in the backdrop that I talked about. Oh, well, yes. Nandan, to you for your you know, initial comments as well. And as we just spoke about, as uh, Dr. Chand also said, soon farmers could be asking for MSP for mangoes and things that are not covered right now. We were also having a conversation earlier on how Punjab, even as it has such fertile land and only does wheat and paddy and has to import fruits and vegetables, do you think a lot of things from here on need to start changing? So firstly, I think honored to be a part of this panel and slightly intimidated as well. I think we will be, uh, I mean, we're probably, I'll go and give my perspective and point of view uh, with respect to how we are closer to consumers and how we are seeing demand patterns play out. And based on that, I'll give my perspective, but uh, obviously we're pretty much very new and nascent in the space. Uh, uh, and given Instamart or quick commerce in general as a category has evolved over the last two, three years while food delivery has been the for eight years, but coming specifically to your question, I think uh, what, uh, based on at least uh, what I was looking at from a data point of view, when we are talking about, let's say, diversification and uh, what other, what are the other things to look at? I think we maybe need to also shift the conversation a little bit. Uh, uh, from saying, hey, what else outside of maybe wheat and rice to actually s looking at specific interventions across the board. For example, when I was looking at data with respect to how diversification happened over the last 30 years, there's been very good movement around livestock. I think that's also led by Amul. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, what has happened on the milk side of things uh, and uh, a few other sectors which have done well. But I think one place where maybe things can be better is horticulture and horticulture is incredibly complex and we've also seen that over the last two years we deal with around tens of thousands of metric tons of uh, FNV every day uh, and we deal with a lot of small farmers as well uh, and what we've seen is some of the challenges are with respect to how much wastage there is of horticulture and the lack of infrastructure from a cold chain storage and supply chain point of view uh, which does and this is uh, basically what we've seen across the country as well. Uh, primarily, the uh, uh, one of the reasons why you know a lot of uh, players on the consumer side uh, face some difficulties is because uh, of this wastage not necessarily having a lot of reliability of supply for the consumer, where things are not on in stock or there is a lot of issues with respect to quality because of uh, some of these uh, uh, infrastructural problems. I think that's one probable key area that needs to be solved. I think one of the interventions or one of the ways to think about it is be a little more specific saying, hey, uh, can we actually really go after solving uh, for horticulture? Can we actually really go after solving for maybe uh, uh, storage, supply chain, cold storage, etc.? cetera? Uh, and uh, try to maybe take a leaf out of probably what Amul's done, uh, where uh, that probably the movement there didn't start off by saying what else can we do outside of wheat and rice. It started by saying how can we empower and enable the Kaira dairy farmers, right? And that is basically the kind of missionary driven approach that is needed for, let's say, saying, hey, listen, we want to be able to really enable this particular vertical and help that 
uh, versus being uh, uh, maybe uh, a, a little more generic and actually kind of look at specific interventions across the board. I think that's maybe a good place to start. All right. Yeah. So with that, we have had the first initial comments and what is top of our mind of our panelists in. I'll ask you all some questions now and would ensure or would request very short answers, one line answers perhaps, and what comes to your mind with those kind of things. Sir, I'll start with you. Climate change is a big thing right now. What are you as a government doing to ensure that it doesn't come in your way as you plan in another 10 years? That's a loaded question. I don't think you have a one word answer or one sentence answer. <laughs> You, know, you have to balance out, you know, in this country full of extremes where you have extreme rainfall and extreme drought. The only way to do this is by building more reservoirs where you store water in the time of plenty and use it in the time of a drought. That sort of balancing is what Telangana has done. Therefore, our dependence on rain-fed crops has come down in a big way. That is something the rest of the country needs to emulate. Even a small country like Zimbabwe has a 6,500 TMC capacity reservoir. And in India, the largest reservoir is only a 600 TMC. So we need more of those across the country. We need to harvest at the time of plenty and use it at the time of drought. We do know that, Dr. Chan, don't we? But uh, I want to stop watching movies where the Kisan is still looking in the sky. I want to watch movies where we're doing irrigation. I mean, do we have that coming? Uh, last uh, six years, every year, we have increased area under irrigation by one percentage point. Now, more area is irrigated than what is rain fed. So this change happened in year 2020 that we have now 53% area under irrigation and only 47% area that is rain fed. So that we've is we've done a aspect. lot, but with the kind of yeah, climate coming. change is happening. Yeah, I'm coming. But even if we use 100% of our irrigation potential, still you will find that one third area will be rain fed. But rain fed doesn't mean we can't address the water requirement of the crop. There are different ways even to address the moisture, stress, etc., etc. Coming to climate change, irrigation is one way of uh, mitigating effect of uh, high temperature, uh, drought, etc. But there are many other ways. You see, climate change has not started happening just suddenly in year 2010 or year 2020. It has been happening, realized, last 20, 30 years. And there were forecasts that because of climate change, wheat yield will come down by so much percent, rice yield will come down by so much percent. But science has countered the adverse effect of climate change so far. In coming, it is possible, 10, 15 years, science will again be countering the adverse effect of climate change because there is some adaptability mechanism within plant. You get a gene which is tolerant to temperature of 46, 47, put it in the crop, so that way it is possible. But beyond that point, I think it will become impossible. Even adaptation will not help. That is why we need to go for mitigation and mitigation at global level. The effect of climate change which happened in India is not only because of what Indians are doing, but a farmer in Brazil do affect agriculture in India. But a farmer do in India affect agriculture in Mexico. So since this is a global phenomena, that's why COP uh, conferences are there, that science will enable us to adapt. But ultimately, we must pay attention to mitigation and for mitigation, action has to be at local level, but we need to have those commitments from all actors, all stakeholders, and all countries. Dr. Gupta, what's your sense on that? Because March was the hottest year in 122 years, and then we've seen unseasonal rain. So when you look at aquaculture as a subject, how is climate change impacting you? I mean, other subjects also, there is pollution and there is overfishing. There's just way too much that you would need to keep an eye on. Yes, because of the pollution and the overfishing, that's why we are di the production from the natural resources like the seas and the rivers have gone down. That's why we have been talking of the increase in the production from aquaculture. With all the water resources that we have, we have an ex excellent potential for increasing, as I said earlier, also for meeting the local demand and also for the export that we have been talking about. Now, in the last few years, enabling policies 
and interest has been created by both with the state government and also the central government. And also interest, industry is coming forward to take advantage of these policies and the interest of the government. So I see a br very bright future for, for the fisheries sector to contribute to the global and also the country's economy and also the food security. Mr. Sodi, how do you look at the next 10 years when it's about climate and how do you see it impacting animal husbandry, uh, cattle stock and dairy as a subject? As a climate. How prepared are we? I mean, we understand what we are doing in sense of me fiscal measures and policy measures and various things happening. How prepared are we with climate when we look at all of these? Well, I think all the industry is very much concerned about the sustainability and the emission. And uh, it is our responsibility also that we should ensure that uh, to the next generation we are able to give the same word which we got, the thing. And it's everybody duty. But Manisha ji, I like to on sustainability and climate. It's a very hot topic. Everybody is talking. I'll just give you one anecdote. About a uh, year back, I was in. I had gone to. Uh, Vancouver to attend International Dairy Federation board meeting and after the board meeting they took us to a farm to show us organic dairy farmer and we were seven members as soon as we alighted from the car uh, one of the farmer who was the owner he Im immediately said hello Mr. Sodi how are you and I was surprised how in this part of the world this fellow knows me and uh, he said Mr. Sodi do you recognize me I said no he said, it's okay, but you may have forgotten me, but four years back, I heard you in Quebec in some conference, and you said one line, the liner which you wanted to expect, which I must have narrated to hundreds of thousands of platforms on this environment and sustainability. I said, I had forgotten. So he told me, you said, sustainability starts when stomachs are full. Sustainability starts when stomachs are full. Actually, this climate, environment, sustainability is a very good word, but you have to see from the perspective of all. If you ask a farmer, what do you mean by sustainability? His only answer is livelihood. I want to earn my food. You ask any state governments, what do you mean by sustainability? And for them, the sustainability is providing livelihood to 140 crore people as well as the employment. You ask any of the business people here, for them, sustainability is the profits or bottom line. You ask any environmentalist, for them, sustainability is what we are talking, emission. But if you are sustainable to the consumers, what they will say, for them, sustainability is affordable food after affordable living conditions so we have to see when we are talking about environment it's a very good point and we all have to contribute but nevertheless let me tell you in dairy animal husbandry is the most sustainable thing this the god has created earth interdependent on three things plants human being and animal we all are dependent on each other Nobody can survive without, even plants can't survive without animal. Same is human being. So we have to see what are the other areas of saving environment. Animal has been this one part, that it sh but it should not be made a scapegoat or a tool to exploit the developing countries because they are becoming more and more self-sufficient in food, which is impacting the markets of developed economy. Fair point. Thank you. Mr. Sivakumar, this one is to you. I don't want to talk to you about climate now. I want to talk about the next 10 years and the very fast pace, the way our uh, lifestyles are changing. There is more disposable income. There are more working population. There is younger population in India. There are alternate uh, proteins. There also is lab-grown meats and lab-grown foods coming into the market. There is just so many changes coming in. What is the world that you envisage 10 years down from here when you look at food? So you didn't ask me about climate, but let me link it up with climate anyway uh, and, and deal with this uh, question. I think I, I draw the analogy from uh, IT industry uh, that 
India has participated in over the last uh, over two decades and what food industry will participate in the coming years. We had initially started participating on the basis of uh, the labor cost arbitrage and then moved through skill building and infrastructure creation at a higher value IT industry. Very similarly, uh, what is going to happen in the food industry and we are seeing early signs uh, through all these FTAs and all that you referred a little earlier is alternate supply chains built on climate arbitrage. Alternate supply chains as in it's not normal trade transaction that uh, I engage with an importer uh, from India or I engage with a uh, consumer through whatever channel in some metro market and so on. But you actually have a long-term relationship exactly the way a large global company says, here is my IT order signed up for the next five years of half a billion dollars. That's how the alternate supply chains in the food are going to get built. Uh, because if you just look at next 75 years for which scenarios have been built by IPCC on climate, uh, various kind of uh, temperature ranges, we see that where we are growing some crops now, we will just not be able to grow them 20 years from now. And where we are not growing certain crops, we are better off growing those crops in that area. So I think preparing that is how the alternate supply chains will work, but in conjunction with demand, because I said demand responsive is a crucial factor, and then it will plug in all these different elements that you talked about. What is the value addition? What are the consumer looking for? And then how do you create an alternate supply chain at the back end? I think that is going to be the key shift that we will see. Okay, my final round of comments from everybody now, and Nandan, I'll start with you on this. What is your 10-year vision in food industry, and what is that one priority you think needs to be done like now? Uh, so, like adding to the earlier thing I mentioned, I think there is a lot of uh, maybe investments required into certain specific areas of infrastructure like cold cho chain storage, etc., for anything to basically really make sense later on as well. That's, I think, one key area of focus. Uh, but I think the next one is probably going to be around food processing and just breaking that into a couple of sectors, right? One, I think what we've seen in the country is a lot of brands have been, like I think Amul and ITC are obviously stalwarts there with respect to having really taken, uh, built incredible consumer brands on the back of agricultural products and really built supply chains and infrastructure across the board. I think the one thing that in general hasn't maybe evolved to the level that, uh, uh, that it maybe should have is modern retail or basically in general the evolution of retail has probably not necessarily caught up to pace with how some of the brands have uh, taken off. I think we need a lot more investment and we need a lot more evolution of that retail landscape to happen. I think that's incredibly important because uh, the more demand there is also locally and the more formats of retail there are, etc., there is going to be, the e this ecosystem is just going to get built up. So I think that's one uh, thing that I see at least basically uh, evolving uh, over the next 10 years. The second space I think uh, in food processing is probably even Horeca as, uh, and I've seen this firsthand myself, I was actually a restauranter in Hyderabad a decade ago and I kind of basically saw the uh, difficulties that restauranters face with respect to just handling a menu, right? There is just uh, not enough Horeca food processing units in the country that can help restauranters be able to scale their operation. For example, obviously, we've uh, maybe there has been news about this also. The kind of uh, craze that let's say Hyderabadis have for biryani is incredible. Uh, but once it uh, and while there's a lot of restauranters who are able to do it at a single unit level for me to open maybe 10 restaurants, it gets incredible difficult because the back-end supply chain and the investments needed are massive and at some level if you were to think about it uh, uh, that the uh, that would probably help increase uh, increase not just farmer incomes but also the overall ecosystem quite a bit if we are able to actually look at horeca and food processing together and say uh, if the country probably needs 
uh, a million more restaurants, right? And one data point that is always interesting is I think India overall has lesser restaurants than Beijing does. And I think probably that is the potential as well where there is probably a million more restaurants that are needed, but the food processing uh, capability for being able to handle million restaurants doesn't necessarily exist right now. And I think there is a lot more that should be done uh, in terms of being able to build that capability for us as a country. You want to answer that in some sense? Yeah, in fact, um, just a couple of things adding to uh, what he said, Nandan said. You know, the gastronomical um, delights from India, in fact, are taking the world by the storm today. If you look at London or if you look at UK and how they lap up Indian food there, and how even in the US, in fact, uh, the doors are getting open, you know, Indian food is becoming as popular as many other very, very important, uh, uh, you know, cultural uh, cuisines from other parts of the world. But there is, I, th I think we've barely begun to scratch the surface because honestly, if you think about how the soft power of uh, Indian culture can really help uh, even the farmers and even the baseline here, I think there's a huge, huge potential that needs to be tapped. That is something that, uh, you know, we all can work on. The two, three other things that I would quickly mention, you know, we need to also have a fair understanding of what land holdings in India are like. In India, the land holdings are extremely small, less than two and a half acres. The only way, you know, a farmer can actually use drones to spray pesticides. The only way, you know, uh, we can have uh, a farmer actually have access to a harvester is by Uberization of, uh, you know, at a block level, maybe Uberize all the agri implements, you know, all the agri uh, mechaniza mechanization tools that we have at our disposal, those can be Uberized. Also, you know, if in India, uh, in a country like India, which is as chaotic as, uh, you know, any on the planet, if we have to dream of autonomous vehicles, I think the only autonomous vehicle I can dream of is a tractor. Because, you know, I don't think Indian uh, roads will allow for an autonomous car that easily. I think uh, uh, autonomous tractors is something that we could do with. More importantly, more importantly, community managed sustainable agriculture. I differ with Mr. Sodhi on sustainability. I don't think it's the rules of the first world to actually, you know, kind of deny us of our rightful place, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in the in the sun, sh in the sun, in the sunlight or sunshine. What I honestly feel, Mr. Sodhi, is there are a lot of things we can do it in our, within within the realm of, uh, you know, being a very, you know, a country with, which is lower in in the social ladder in terms of uh, our per capita, etc. We can do a lot of things. We can have solar pump sets helping our farmers. We can have biogas plants actually helping our even dairy farmers. There's so many things that we can do. You know, the little space that we have in terms of sustainability. Sustainability doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, like green has become a fad today. They talk about green steel, green ammonia, green this, green that. Tomorrow there will be a time when they'll say green milk. So you be prepared for that. Because I think we ought to start somewhere in terms of, you know, building puzzle by puzzle, piece by piece. And I think it is imminently doable. The fact is, Manisha, agri plus allied sectors and with each of them being a focus. Fisheries, such large number of tanks which go unutilized, need to be tapped. Dairy, nobody needs to teach Indians how to actually, you know, uh, 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 milk a cow and, you know, get, get, you know, get going on the dairy value add. Likewise, again, nobody needs to teach Indians, uh, you know, who already have acquired the skill of, uh, you know, rearing sheep and goats and other things. You know, we talk about skill development as a fancy subject. Our chief minister always says, what about already developed skill? What are you doing about it? So these are the things I think if we understand, you know, the grassroots of India, we can really focus on these issues, incentivize them, promote them, and therefore, you know, become a leader for the rest of the world as well. Very well spoken. So let me, let me just ask you this thing. I, I know you, you haven't given me a one word answer until now, but if you had to say one thing that is an opportunity for the next 10 years, what is that? Within food, within agriculture. Food within agriculture, I think uh, biomanufacturing. I think we are headed because I already tasted an impossible burger. <laughs> Trust me, it's as good as any normal burger. And I think that's the future because I think there is a time when veganism is going to take over. Mm. I'm sure some of you may not like this, mm. but uh, yeah, the time is not too far. Plant based meat is going to happen, biomanufacturing is going to happen. We never dreamt that it would happen in our lifetime, it's already happening. Yeah. And uh, when I was in the US, I tasted it, and I can tell you. It is going to be the that future and it will shape the world. Mr. Sivakumar, one word that you see in the next 10 years that defines the next 10 years for you. Counterintuitively, I see that climate is one of the biggest opportunities that we have. Mm. If we anticipate and work 
both in adaptation and mitigation. Uh, because I said, the next few years, like the last few years for IT industry, the future is, how do you work on the climate arbitrage? And, and given the diverse country that we are, we already see that kind of map, which is very visible. So climate change as an opportunity. Right. While I'm at it, how, do you dis how would you describe Hyderabad or Telangana in one word? I came here in 1989. All my offices have moved into multiple locations that I handle. I stayed put here. This is a place to be in. <laughs> All right, then. Dr. Chan, what would you say? What is that one word for you when it comes to food for next 10 years and your one word for Telangana? Uh, uh, about food and agriculture, I would say that agriculture is very, very important for us in the present, but it will be much more important in the future. Therefore, in my view, sustainability question cannot be ignored. Agriculture consumes 90% water in this country. And there are many people who don't get adequate water even for drinking. If we allow the profligate, indiscriminate use of natural sources by agriculture, the future of mankind will come under threat. So agriculture has to become more efficient and more responsible in terms of sustainability, addressing climate change and the issues which are of uh, longer term interest uh, uh, to the society. For Telangana, I would say that uh, uh, this is a state which is known for uh, innovation. I think it has the potential to lead the country in new ways of doing agriculture in the next 10 to 25 years. Dr. Gupta, we hope you're ready with that catchy line, sir. Fish for health. Fish, Fish for, for health. health. Oh, right. Fish for good health. Is that is good to that? <laughs> yes, sir. What's your sense? What is that one word that you see uh, as an opportunity for the coming decade? Uh, Telangana is actually showing the way. If you look at the export potential, it's all based almost 100% on the marine fish. But the freshwater fish has not uh, been a part of the export commodity, but Telangana, by starting this aqua hub, is showing that freshwater also fish can also contribute to the export market. I think this is beginning. Uh, they can, this can be a showpiece to other parts of the country and uh, uh, show a way. And it's not only the coastal people who could benefit, but also the inland people also can benefit. And also this will increase the consumption of the fish, which is the cheapest animal protein that is possible now. I think uh, what I can see is for the food industry, next 10 years is going to be the golden period. And it is going to get record um, double digit volume growth in food industry. You had inflation 5 6%, so 16 17%. But for that, one side, state or central government has see where to put the resources. So, resources need to be put in the industry food where growth is coming, potential is coming, not in a traditional way of grains. And other side, it is a responsibility industry that you can accelerate the growth by enlarging the size, not competing with each other and also coming with the food in the organized basic food. There is always market for high end niche, but basic food needs to be organized. And that is the job and responsibility of industry. Like Honorable Minister said, Monday, August, Sunday, Rojka, one day, as any industry has to come, how to increase the consumption among the average Indian or low class Indian. Then only industry will grow, industry grows, Farmer will grow and prosperity will be there. Thank you. And what's your word one for Telangana? How would you describe the state? What does it mean for you? You see, I can see Telangana is, if you want Telangana to grow any industry like IT or technology, you need to provide them a good food at affordable price. Then only you can keep wages under control. Because what? why India or... Uh, Telangana is good in IT because here you will get the anybody who, who who is able to get good food at affordable price. If you were to depend on imported food 
and then ask people to work for IT, it will, wages will be high, and then you will not be competitive in the India or the world. So being the competent food has to be good and affordable. Which it is here. So, sir, last uh, final comments from you on to this one. You know, one thing I can tell you, I've seen uh, and I've met a lot of industry participants over the years um, in our conversations on the channel as well and other platforms as well. But this is the first time that they are here not to network but to be part of this food conclave. And that says a lot. And the, everybody is here. And, and they, they want to be here. They want to open offices here. They want to do business with here. With the kind of conversation that you've had on the stage with them also is something that I have heard them applauding. What are you going to tell all of these, um, uh, you know, companies, participants, delegates that are here today on what are you promising them now for next 10 years? Well, I'll say a couple of things. You know, food is something that we can't do away with. You know, I think as human beings, as long as humanity is going to be on this planet, food is something that is going to be an essential ingredient on a day-to-day -day basis. So there is no substitute, even though, of course, we might switch to different cuisines, we might switch to superfoods, we might switch to high-protein foods, we might switch to different things. Food ultimately will remain to be uh, uh, something that is going to be in demand. As part of the evolution, I think uh, people will start, you know, uh, eating better more and more. As was pointed out by a minister, consumption patterns will change, food eating, ha eating habits will change. The point is, as an industry, this is an evergreen industry. As an industry, this is uh, something that is going to thrive, prosper. India has in it to be the granary, to be the, you know, uh, uh, food producer for the rest of the world. During COVID, all activities were switched off, but agriculture, but for ag horticulture, and but for these uh, food processing industries. Because it is something that we can't do without. Telangana today offers you a gateway as a destination, you know, to come in, to explore all the five revolutions that are unfolding. We offer you policy support, we offer you incentives. More importantly, most importantly, you have a government that's extremely progressive, wants to work with you, wants to actually amend policies, change policies to be the leader in India and by extension possibly at some point of time down the road, a torchbearer, a role model for the rest of the country. And I promise Mr. Sodhi, he said, uh, keep the prices low, keep the consumption high but prices low. I promise him, we are rated by Mercer as an, as an agency that rates uh, cities on a livability index. We have been rated as the number one Indian city in India for quality of living for five years in a row, from 2015 until 2020. That is because we kept our, we, we, we are affordable, more importantly, and also we continue to remain very, very attractive. My thanks to all the participants who have come from various parts of India, because, you know, this is an eye-opener for us as well, as a government, to bring all these leaders onto one platform and one panel, understand from them, learn from them, and actually implement uh, days to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, panelists, so much. And I, I can tell you one thing, that when you talk about agriculture and food and food processing and the kind of uh, subjects and kind of industries that we have on panel, there is just so much to talk. But as uh, uh, Sar has promised, and I'm taking his word on that, that, this is just the beginning. There's a whole day today. And there is this is happening every year now because there is... It's an annual fixture, yes. There is just so much conversation to have had. And as he said, the state is doing amazingly well. Thank you so much for being an amazing audience. And thank you, panelists, for your time. Thank you.